about carry-on. I'm going to tell you this. I have, the reason why we're talking about it now is I know something I can't tell you. If there's anyone in this room that thinks it's a fake, don't put your hand up and say it because you're going to make a fool of yourself because it isn't. I know it's going to be proved and I know it'll be proved within two years. I know that as a fact. I wish I could say so much more because there's a camera here, isn't yeah. there? I'll, I'll be as cryptic as I can. Yeah. Right, before we start talking about carry-on, you've probably heard stories about university students that were bored one day and decided to spend three weeks out there in the 60s. By the way, do you know the Sydney Uni have never taught hieroglyphs and never taught Egyptology? So I'd like to know why they were doing it and who supervised it. I want to meet the person because apparently our next lecturer went out there and supervised the thing for three weeks. I'd love to meet this person and find out what right they've got to supervise anything. Sydney Uni have never taught hieroglyphs, they've never taught Egypt Egyptology. And by the way, if they had done it, you don't think one of those students one day when they got drunk wouldn't have started boasting about it? Come on, you don't think someone would have given their name up by now? That's rubbish. What about the deranged check that wandered in there between the walls in 1975 with a chisel? No hammer, just a chisel, and made all this. That's a good one. I've heard that a lot. You might have heard the one about the grieving World War I uh, veteran who decided to make a monument in the bush in the middle of nowhere. He did make one in St. Ives where there were no hieroglyphs at all. It was just a monument. But he made this one in the middle of nowhere where no one ever see it as a monument to his friends. That's a possibility too. And do you know what? It could have been done by hippies. It could have been done by New Ages. And it could have been done by a parrot for all I know. Everyone's been chucked in. But the one thing I can tell you about all those stories, I, I can't give you a name. There isn't one. They're all groups of people and, and in this, this, like a deranged check and a, a vet that's not here anymore. I want to tell you the, the truth, and I'll go in two parts. First of all, I'll tell you what Aunty Bev said, who was the last darking young elder. Then I'll tell you what David Fitzgerald said, who was paid by National Parks and Wildlife to be the Aboriginal Sites Officer when it was found. Their testimony should count for something. I can tell you what Aunty Bev tells us about the glyphs. They are, some of them are Egyptian. And you know, the women would go there every second year for millennia and coat it with women's urine to keep it fresh. David Fitzgerald who was taken there in 1978, check the records, they didn't see it until 1983 according to their records, he was taken there by National Parks and Wildlife in 78 and when he went there he couldn't see a thing because the walls were full of refuse and they hired six men two days to clear it out and they moved out about five tonne of rubbish, 1978. According to one report from National Parks and Wildlife in 1975, we've got a deranged check just walking through there with a chisel in hand just punching away as he feels like it. David told me there was 25 years of refuse there. If you look very carefully there, you'll find out why the glyphs are kept fresh. There was a wall on top, a ceiling on top, and it fell down. It broke. There are still parts of the wall that are ceiling there. All of this is true. Now I'm going to tell you the part of the story that I can't substantiate, but I know it's true because I know that one of the people eventually is going to give it up because their conscience is killing them. When it was found in 1978, not 83, the person in charge decided they didn't want anything to do with it. And they put it on to some others. And I can tell you, one of the plans was to blow it up. They had arranged with the Commonwealth Government to use the Gosford Glyphs for artillery practice. And it was going to be blown up. I know that as a fact because I know absolutely who was involved in the conversation. I know what was said. Um, there are people, it's always the case, conscience will always come back. There's a person who's going to give this up. I can't say who and I can't say when, but they will give it up. And there's a couple of people who know what I'm talking about, know a bit more about it. But I can tell you now, what those other people said is correct. It was found, in, it was found before 78. It's been there for quite some time. It is legitimate and it is not been made by any of these other people. That story about the drains check, it was given to you by Alan Dash, who was working for Gosford City Council. Are you aware very soon after he did that, he got a job with National Parks and Wildlife and still holds it to this day? It was such a cover-up at every level, and it was a conspiracy, and I can tell you now, to involve the army, it doesn't just go to the local council, you have to go to the Commonwealth to get this involved. This will come. It will all come up. We're very comfortable talking about it now because we know the full story. If I could tell you more, I would, but I can't because then I tell you the name of the people involved and they've got to make that decision themselves. What have we got there? It's truth. Can we go back one first? 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you've seen it, there's about 300, I think well, probably half the people in this room have seen it. Who's seen the glyphs here? This, oh, God. A lot of you. The ones who haven't, go and have a look at it, for God's sake, please. It's legit. Okay, you've seen the walls before. We'll go through them quickly. There's a breakdown of one section of it, which we've, what I've done is I've gone through in Proto-Egyptian from Ray Johnson's manual and worked something out. And what I have worked out, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the wall that's still got a roof on the top, that is Proto-Egyptian. I can find you Nefertijeb there. I can find the part about the wrecked boats. I can find the part about one of them dying. That's all there. I don't argue that point. But when you go past that wall to the other two walls, and you may have seen videos about it, they won't show you the other two walls. I'll do the first wall, and they'll read you through that and tell you what it is. You know why they won't show you the other two walls? Because our manual, the Proto-Egyptian, we only got a 42% match, and they won't do much better. There are glyphs there that no one recognises. And you know, when they sent the officials there, the two academics in the late 80s, they came back and said, that's not Egyptian. There's stuff in there that's Sumerian. There's stuff that's all over. Yes, because this, ladies and gentlemen, go away from that. That's the Egyptian narrative. The rest of that narrative is original. The original people were the ones to write first. How do I know that? Aunty Bev told me this. We wrote before they did. The Egyptians came here to learn their language, their writing, their religion, and their knowledge. They got it from us. I want to make that clear, and I'm not the only one who said that. We've got more that say the same thing. They came here in pilgrimage, like people go to Mecca, to learn from their betters. Very important. As um, Slavis is the Egyptians learned their system of hieroglyphs from the ancestors of our Aborigines. And that came out of a report from the newspaper in 1935. Slater, who we're going to talk about, is involved in the Standing Stone site. You're going to find out the Egyptians learnt their, 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 their whole thing comes from here. All that they've learnt. They came here first and took it back. Now, the original narrative, that glyph is the most important glyph there. It starts the second wall. Uh, we've been working with Laird Scranton on this one. He believes that's the marker for the first language called Narki. It has two other meanings, black man and serpent. That's why it belongs there. And then there's a narrative that goes through there. Now, what I'm not going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm not going to give you my interpretation of that because I don't think it's important. You see, who cares what it means if mainstream doesn't even believe it's legitimate? We have to prove it's legitimate first, then argue about what it means. And I think to an extent the fact that we've got three, three different groups arguing with each other about what it means is not helping. We shouldn't be fighting over what it means until we get people to agree that it's legitimate. Because at the moment... Mainstream says this is a fake. Well, that's what we've got to work on first. I can say the mainstream's days are numbered because we know that that's going to come unstuck. But for now, let's move through that, mate. OK, uh, Michael Tellinger and Louise, they actually have been to the glyph. They went there straight away, and I can tell you now, they locked into it at a much better level. They locked into it at a spiritual level. Um, and this guy and this lady really did understand it's a spiritual site. That's why we put them up there. They did understand why they were there. Next one, please, mate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do now... I haven't done this for a while, have we? No. God. OK. What I'm going to do now is one of the reasons we got involved in this to begin with is... Now, let's look at the Egyptian story, because that's all we're doing right now. I'm starting with... I said we go back. Now, the Egyptians were here from 440 years ago to 4,600 years. They were here for 4,200 years. We know where they left. They left at Balmoral. All four of them were speared when they stole some rocks from the middle and they were told never to come back. And they came here 4,600 years ago and they started to carry on. And they were here, and here's the part you need to understand, all of that time. You do realise there are a group of Egyptians now, aren't you, Evan? Yep. What have they said? Oh, but um, they have Rights of an embassy. Yeah, um, yeah, colonial rights as a, an embassy here in Australia. Yeah, I, one of the shows over there. yeah, there are Egyptians now claim that they have rights to set up an embassy here, and actually they do. They do have rights. They've got more rights than the bloody British. Anyway, let's start with this one, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to show you a group of um, engravings all near Carry On, but I won't tell you where. The first one here is of an unk. It's, it's actually, we were taken out by a gentleman who was a senior park ranger at the time of this place. And he also has a degree in geology. And his claim is, 
and I'm not going to argue with this, we saw about 80 different engravings. This was the oldest by a long way. In fact, 22 pictures to take that. And we sent someone out there recently, yeah, didn't we? And they couldn't find it. it. They could not find it. It's so worn. We were lucky because they knew exactly where to look. And we waited for the sun just to come out for a second to get oh, that shot. Dramatic. Yeah, yeah. Now, what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, you can't see it, but it's there. There's a footprint there of an ibis. I've got an unk and an ibis. That's Thoth. Thoth and... form is an ibis and he carries with him an unk. This is Egyptian but according to uh, John Gallard, the senior park ranger, he claimed this is over 10,000 years old. Well the Egyptians weren't even talking about unks 10,000 years ago. They were in the desert, were spitting camels and just parking where they were. There was no pyramids then. This is before the Egyptians said these words. This is what he said, the oldest one there and that's an unk. Take it for what it is. Next one please then. We'll go through this quickly. Um, this is found in the same area. Now, I've got to tell you something about Aboriginal people. When they do humans, they do two eyes. They can do animals with one eye, humans with two. I have to see their soul. One eye. And that's an ibis head, sideways. That looks like Thoth, but it can't be, because down the bottom, look at the legs there. The legs. I've got a longer leg and a club foot. That's Duramon, the son of Biami. Duramon, the son of Biami, it's like Jesus. And he's always drawn with a club foot and one leg shorter than the other. So what I've got here, Thoth up the top, Duramillan down the bottom. Which came first? Well, I'm starting to realise that. Next one, oh, hang on, wait up. I knew. Put the warning up. I knew before the warning came up. Anyone here got traditional, any woman here been given traditional, original uh, ceremony? Good. No worries. It's happened once and she had to leave the room crying. This next one can't be seen by a traditional woman. This is Dura Mullen in full gear, but you need to see it for a different reason. What's he wearing? An Egyptian headdress. What's the story? The story is in Galba. He's using her sacred shield. You can't see in Galba. There's a sacred shield there. And he's dead. He's been taken to the underworld. And in Galba, as singing him back and bringing him back together and bringing him back from the underworld. Sounds like Osiris and Isis stole this story, I think. It sounds very similar with the shaft of Tet. That's a sacred symbol that's found all over the country. Very sacred sign. That's the same story, ladies and gentlemen. And that is Duramullan, by the way. But he seems to have that sort of monkey feature now because Duramullan, uh, sorry, Foth had two geysers, Ibis and Ape. And I think we've seen both of them here. Now, you might be thinking, oh, maybe, maybe not. Foth is a god of knowledge. Well, we found another Egyptian god. If you could put it up, please, Evan. There's the insignia. And there he is there. See that right angle arm like that? See the hands are like that? This is called the God of Inheritance. What a coincidence. The two that we found here is the God of Wisdom, the God of Inheritance. Who's given who to something? I think we know the answer to that now. That is also found there. That's the only carving like that you're going to find in Australia. We never found it like that anywhere. I've never seen, I've never seen 90 degrees angles like that. This is Egyptian, ladies and gentlemen. No, it's not. It's what the Egyptians took back. That's what they were given. Next one, please, mate. All ah, right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing is we're going around the glyphs. We now have film of this, don't we? Yes. And ancient aliens were putting that up. They're actually putting the show up in about six weeks. Something like that. It'll be up soon. And what that we managed to get is behind the glyphs, is a 10 metre channel. By the way, they're trashing it now, aren't they? They're pulling the rocks out, they're destroying it. They're deliberately destroying it. And you know who's doing it? National Parks and Wildlife. I'm not denying that, they are. What happens is, when this film was taken, and we have film of it, some people, who we don't know who they are, probably got some mining equipment and winches and picked up about five to six tonnes of rocks. I don't know who they would be and took them all out, and the next day we turned up and all the rocks were gone. Magically. Magically. And one of the gentlemen who might have been there the days before was on film looking shocked like, oh, what's happened here? I don't know what happened, I've no idea, because that could be breaking the law. Because National Parks and Wildlife want that tunnel filled. They don't want you to see it. Now, 
we have a professor that works for us on the quiet and he finally got National Parks and Wildlife to make an official comment about that, that shaft that goes for 10 metres. It involves a Germanic German tribe. It does too, yeah, it does. It does very much that, yeah. It involves a dramatic German tribe that came down and must have done it because they said vandals did it. It wasn't the Huns, it was the vandals. The best part was the vandals who did this, they didn't tag it and they took all of the stuff they dug out away. It's not there. Ten metre tunnel. They've admitted it's not natural. They've said that. Now they've said, oh God, if it's not a deranged check or a group of students we can't find, now it's a group of vandals again. See how they do this every time they give an excuse. It's always something you can't challenge. Which vandals? Oh, they're gone now. Well, which ones were they? Oh, we're not sure, but they were definitely vandals. Did you got a picture of them doing it? No. Have you got a stat deck of someone saying that I did it? No, but it was vandals. They haven't got a stat deck. They're lying. Okay, next one. Right, the star markers above. Oh, there's yeah, H and A. Remember that? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what's very important? Can you go to the next one after? They're the. Can you go back one? These are actually, there are literally around this region, if he goes back, there are literally thousands of those. And I do mean literally thousands. There's one actual rock platform we're working on that's got a thousand. It's considered the largest star map in the world. More quantity than anywhere else. And we're, so far we've marked about 360 of them, haven't we? We've only got 540 to go. And about six more days to do it in. Now, the interesting part of the story is they are all around this area. They're obsessed with upstairs, but what's really important is the next map. That one. Because when you go directly above the glyphs, the Egyptian part, you will find, I know where that place is, and I've taken some people there, I've actually taken you to there. And what you're going to find there, ladies and gentlemen, is that star date, that star chart's been dated to be 4,600 years old. Proto-Egyptian is 4,600 years old. And the Proto-Egyptian is just below where that star chart is. The original people put that in to tell you the Egyptians started here 4,600 years ago. They made it so that dumb people, when they come along later, would work it out. And we're still fighting over it. But they tried their best to help us. Next one, please, mate. Oh, that's right. Christ, what's the second picture doing there? Yeah, that's you. Oh, Jesus. I don't like looking at that. We'll look at the wall while I talk about this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the deranged check. The Sydney Uni students were supposed to have done the glyphs between the walls. There has never been a story where they said, oh, then they went it off in the countryside and they did it here and they did it there and they did it somewhere else. No, it was done between the walls. So my question is, why did we find this set of glyphs hundreds of metres away? Hey? Why did we find them? What are they doing there? And how smart is this deranged check? You've got to give them credit because you know what this says because we can read it. This is clever. For a deranged check to work this out, that means death. That's a direction pointer. That one there that you can't see, but trust me because we've been told this, is a staff that can only be held by the son of the pharaoh. He knew that, that clever little bugger, and he knew that was the case. And it gets better because that cliff there says the burial, where you'll find it, is in the back shaft. That means back door or back shaft. I just showed you the shaft. So that very clever deranged check, by the way, he must have also made the shaft too to put it in. He's then gone 100 metres away and then made a very clever story. But here's the best part. These glyphs are about one third the size and nowhere near as deep are they. And they'll cut with a different instrument by a different person. So how clever is that? He's got a different instrument, made it a different size and a different cut just to trick us some more. So that is what... One that's higher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's more up further up. Yeah, there's one that's right up the top of the cliff that you could, you'd have to abseil to get to. Gee, they're clever, those deranged checks. I mean, I don't know how they come up with this stuff, but they do. But that's, by the way, that, that's the official story. You can smile at it, but that's what they're hanging on to, ladies and gentlemen. Next one, please, mate. Oh, no, we're going to do this. What are you laughing for? You know what I'm going to... Did you laugh then, Richard? Oh, yes, you did. All right, the people who've done this before cannot participate in this. <sighs> do I have to leave the room? No, we'll get to that later in a sec. Right, I'm not going to do it twice. I'm only going to do it once, okay? Because my track record is not great here. All right, let's start with this. Let's start with this. And I'm going to grab someone from the room here because we're going to just break it for a sec. We'll have a break soon because we know we're going to have to break in the middle. This was found by Arnie Minnie Mace with Ray Johnson when they went to the glyphs. 
They were the very first people to bring this to the world's attention. Now, Aunty Minnie Mace is an original elder and a very strong one at that. She found two things and gave them to us. We didn't want to take them, did we? The first one is this, this thing here. Can I um, get you to participate a bit? I'm just going to drop this in your hand and I want you to tell me what you felt when you first got there. It's very light, thank you so much. It is light. You know why? Well, this is what happened. According to Aunty Minnie, this is Nefertaru. This is the hip bone. Here. That part there. So I rang up our local base hospital and I rang up the fractures unit and said, would you like to look at this? And they got interested and said, yeah, come in. I said, do I have to pay? Because I didn't want to pay. They said, no, come in. So we did. The fractures unit specialist looked at this and said, this looks like a femur, hip bone, and it's ancient. Because what, what bones do, that's why I did this, is as they get very old, they start to get dark and lose their weight. It's old. So what he said was, but we won't know for sure unless you do a CAT scan. I said, well, I don't have the money for that. He said, don't worry, but I'll ring it up. So I went to the base hospital next Monday, and they closed the whole unit up. Six people with white coats, must be sinus, we know from the shampoo ads, and they started spinning the machine around. They said, we'll give it six times the normal dose because the patient won't complain. So they really hammered this thing with radiation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know what they come up with? They said, we've never worked with four and a half thousand year old bones. We said, well, the only thing we can tell you is it has got exactly the same density as a human bone. So according to the experts, it's ancient, it's a bone, it's human, and it was found directly next to that shaft I just showed you. Only Minnie picked it up. What could it be? Well... I'll get it analysed, but I don't trust a lot of experts, so we haven't done it yet. So that's number one. Number two, this can only be involved with people who haven't seen me do this before. Um, Evan, if you'd like to introduce them. Now, I, when we come back, I'm going to talk about a lot of Blackfellow magic, some stuff that we've seen that's utterly amazing. That involves people disappearing in front of us, and Graham Hancock was there, and he'll back it up too. But I'm going to talk a lot about Blackfellow magic, but we need to also talk about what's the other magic, Evan? Thank you so much. Some people think blackfellow magic is extra special. Well, whitefellow magic is pretty deadly too. So, this is... Oh, God help us. I dare not... Yeah, the problem I've had with this... Evan, how many times have I done this now? Uh, 50, something like that. 50? Must be. 20. No. Okay, my score so far at the moment is... I've done this 20 times... I've got 19 and a half misses and one half hit. A little 10 year old, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. You're going to count that, aren't you? Yeah. All right. Doesn't say much for the adults, does it? I've got a 10. <laughs> My biggest problem is him. Negativity. He reeks of it when I do this every time. See how he frowned when I said this straight away? How am I supposed to work under conditions when I've got this negative aura just infecting me? I sort of... I did send him out of the room once, didn't I? Yeah, that was fun. I, the hundred people, I sent him out because I just felt like it was ruining the whole thing. So it turned out, it made no difference. He was still in the area. I could send him... I'd have to send him off to the station or something. So I'm going to put up with it. I'm just going to hope... Come on, you mob. This time, finally, someone's going to get it. Now, this is called... A communal piece of telepathy. I need three ex I need three volunteers, or two volunteers and one victim would be a better way of putting it, yeah, wouldn't it? That is better. Much better. What I need first is two volunteers. Just two people. And by the way, you don't get a humiliated or embarrassed in any way, so it's pretty safe for you. Who would like to volunteer? Lady over there's one. And a gentleman, I'll take one lady, one gentleman. If you want to fold that, don't look at it yet, please. Have you done this before? No. Good, okay. You haven't done this before, have you? Right, you haven't seen my skills. We're here with the, the magic. Okay, now, okay, I have two, you two people are going to work with me. Okay, we are going to combine our psychic abilities together and we're going to focus. Now I need a victim, oh, sorry, volunteer, volunteer, not victim. I need someone now to be the participant in the experiment. Who would be brave or stupid enough to put their hand up? Oh, look at that man, he threw up so quickly. Oh, you should. Well, those who volunteer quickly, isn't that a mistake, Evan? <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, where are my two um, assistants? There they are now. Right, and there is my person we're going to work with. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm now going to do is pull out, not the bone. No, you're not getting that. You're getting this. Now, what's going to happen is I'm not telling you about this yet, am I? You don't know this thing. You don't know what it is, do you? 
Have we met before? But we haven't coerced and worked this out earlier, have we? No, remember that, ladies and gentlemen, when you see this work this time, there was no pre-organisation here. This was just done spontaneously. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to this gentleman. What's your name, by the way? Doug. Doug, I'm going over to Doug. And what I'm going to do, as I get closer, as I get closer, I'm going to ask you two guys to look at the word that I wrote there. You're going to think of that word and project it into his head. Then I'm going to get over the top and do some heavy projecting now, if you come out of this dribbling and you can't talk anymore, we have no insurance for this and you will be a zombie for the rest of your life, but that's just one of the deals with this. When you're a volunteer, mate, you're never sure what you volunteer for. If you do come out of this fine and you're still okay when we move on, we can do it again. Now, what's going to happen is, as I get closer, I'm now going to make you say the word when this artefact hits your hand and you'll have no control. It'll be the same word I'm thinking of. Okay, are you ready to be invaded? Okay. Right, you two guys, now look at the word, please. Start thinking that word. You got that word? I don't need to spell it for you. It's only a five-letter one. It should be okay. You okay with that? I'm a teacher. I've got to look after people. Some people are dyslexic. Now, you're going to put your hand out, and when I drop this in here, you're going to say that magic word. Please. I've tried so hard for this. <laughs> here we, no pressure there, of course. None whatsoever. Here we go. What is the word that comes to your mind when that hits you? Stone. Oh, that was so close. That was so close. It's a bit stone-like. But can we just have a conversation? Excuse me for a sec. <laughs> now, this is metal, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Normally when you get a piece of metal, a big piece of metal hitting you on the ground there, it's normally pretty what? Heavy. Yeah. Heavy. Oh, heavy is a good word. Heavy is a good word. Right. Normally when it's a heavy piece of metal, it feels heavy. Yeah. Now, if it wasn't a heavy piece of metal, it might be an opposite word that maybe someone used before, but don't, I'm not... Tempted. I'm not trying to guide you in any way at all. I'm just filling in the context around that. So we'll drop it back in, expecting, put your hand out, expecting it to be a heavy piece of metal. But it, it may be, I'm not sure. You tell me. Or if it's not, it could be... Light. Oh, thank you so much. I've done it. Light. Can I just double check? Because you might think I'm lying. Could you check, sir? Gentlemen, was that correct? Light is the word? Yeah. Is that the same word? Yeah. Look at that. White fella magic, eh? Not bad, is it? You just thought it was blackfella magic. We've got whitefella magic too. Not bad. I've got to remind you of one thing, whitefella magic. You'll get used to it after a while. It's very clever, but it's normally full of shit. But that's part of the deal with whitefella magic. You can't do much with it. So, ladies and gentlemen, the reason I did this was that particular artefact. If you have a look there, see that semicircular piece there? It was a complete clasp. And Aunty Minnie's children used to go to the disco and dance with it. When you get a four and a half thousand year old artifact, please don't take it to parties and social events. Keep it somewhere safer and it's snapped off. On the back it's completely smooth and on the front you can have a look at it. I don't mind people touching this because it's not the rocks. You can probably see that someone actually kneeling over there. It looks like there's a figure there. By all means have a look at it. You're allowed to touch and of course Shane is our resident security person and if you go around if you walk out with it it'll have to tackle you and beat you up but that's okay and then bring it back but don't take it away no one has yet so the important part is ladies and gentlemen I've had metallurgists all over the country look at this and they cannot identify what it's made from if it's Egyptian they think it's aluminium you only need 2700 degrees for aluminium and you've got to get the impurities out first they did not make aluminium they didn't make alloys but this is definitely it's supposed to be from Neferteru, but the making of this is not Egyptian. Now, this is the trick we find with a lot of this stuff. Yes, it's definitely there, but we, we're getting this, what we're starting to get is towards the end of the Egyptian part of this story we're going to. And I'm going to check with Mariana about what half time is, and you tell me when half time is. What would? Uh, we've got five minutes. Oh, then that's getting close to half time, isn't it? What's next on the list here, please? Sorry. Oh, let's do Klaus's tunnel. Klaus Duna. Someone was mentioning he's putting on a show next year, isn't he? Put it up, please. Right, now, this is where we're starting to go to, I don't believe we're Egyptian anymore. I'm going to keep this in Category 1, but leaning towards Category 2, which is more ancient civilizations. Klaus, through technology I do not understand, has got a gentleman that's got some technology that can look into the earth, and he sent us to a place near Carrion, and he took us to a site very close to the glyphs, but you'll never find it, will they? Nobody's ever going to find this. It's impossible. Um, it is one of the most dangerous sites I've ever been to, and I probably will never go there again. 
put it up. What it is, is a combination of one, two, three walls, which I've drawn up for you now. Notice something, 292, 292. Now this one's 317 because that's a little bit lower. And what they do is they hold a shelf of sandstone weighing about 150 tonnes. It's on the side of a mountain like this. In fact, when you walk around there, you can't stand up, can you? No, it's cruel on hands and knees. If you stood up, you'd fall down the cliff 100 metres and you'd die. You have to crawl on hands and knees. You have to jump to get in. It's as scary as anything and impossible to build on. I don't believe Egyptians could do this. Now, the reason I don't believe this, we're going to show you some pictures of the way the walls looked. Look at that. You think you're in South America because you cannot put a cigarette paper between the joins there. That join there and that one across there. That's one of the three walls. Now that whole wall section is collapsing. We've been back there and it's all falling on top because the top is falling on top of it now. Now it does go into a shaft and I went 15 metres down the first time but I only get five down there now and it leads to something. And we can't say what it is. Although we can say there's a booby trap on top of it, isn't there? Yeah, we nice. found that. And when we saw the booby trap, it was dis we decided, no, we're not going any closer. We're not going near the damn thing because something will fall on us. But this is the entrance to it. Now, the problem is, yes, it's sandstone, but that, that piece of uh, that boulder there would be about two tonne. And it's been sealed up. And I'm just not of the opinion Egyptians are capable of doing this. I'm going to say it sits in the category between maybe and maybe not. But you're going to see those walls in South America only. You will not expect to see them in Australia. Yes, Graham did force himself to go there, didn't he? Yep. And his wife ended up in hospital the next day with a heart attack. That was a great idea on my behalf. I fought with him said, we're not going. But it's a tough place to get to. But he wanted to see it because that don't make sense. Now, when we come back, I'm going to tell you now, that's nothing compared to another site we've got that makes that look like pebbles that have been stacked on top of one another. You've got to understand something. When you come back, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to make this point. The original people, yes, they allowed others to come. But there was a time when going back Atlantis, Lemuria. Where was Lemuria? It was here. It was here. And this place here. Klaus Duna has got 150 different archaeological sites there. So far, we have found four of them. That's one. We would have never found that if we didn't go and find the dot he gave us on the map. And I still don't like going there. He claims, and we all claim the same thing, that Gosford was a massive complex that ran all the way down to the sea. And we've got hits that go 12 kilometres by about eight in a line all the way along. So you've, you've got to understand... The original people, well, you think, and I thought when we started this basis too, that they were always hunter-gatherer people. No, they weren't. They decided the other way didn't work, and they threw away the clothes, they threw away the wheel, they threw away technology, and they kept, they kept that lifestyle until we came because they knew the other lifestyle didn't work. You see, if you go back through the stories, there have been three earlier sets of civilizations. They've all fallen for the same reason. You see, technology doesn't agree with this country. This, is, this country, I'm talking about the whole of this planet, runs on high-octane spiritual fuel. Technology does not agree with it. You see, we've sat with elders, and I'll talk about this more, and we know this is the case, they've disappeared in front of our eyes. I'll tell you stories about stuff that have happened to us that don't fit into science. And if you give me a choice being able to do what I've, I can tell you while watching a flat-screen TV, I'll take the old way. And my understanding is, every time our technology gets too strong and too dirty, it just falls apart. That's what we're learning here. But you've got to understand, who worked this out first? The original people. And when you come back, ladies and gentlemen, I will show you more. I'll show you, in fact, to be honest, when Ancient Aliens are doing the first show with us, I still can't believe they didn't choose Trina's site first. They were going to choose it. Because it's the most obvious, obvious proof in Australia there were earlier civilizations here. They are doing it next year. They're doing it next February. They're going to do three next time. They're doing one with us this time. But when we come back, let me show you a place that you won't believe exists. And I'll show you rocks that are 10 tons that have been cut and placed and placed there. And then later on, we'll show you how they did it because we have the rocks that did that. But that's another story. I think we're having a half hour break now, aren't we? Half hour break. Okay, we'll come back in half an hour and then. 
Wake yourself up and then I'll bring you back and I'll try and put you back to sleep again. Castle Heading in Essex, uh, and it was on an old map spelled D R A G G O N. So it's not any old dragon line, it's a double G dragon line. And it runs from uh, Castle Heading and through Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, where I live, uh, through Thetford, um, through Walsingham, which is a famous. Uh, shrine for pilgrims uh, throughout history, and we found them again in Lincoln and also in Lindisfarne, which is Holy Island off the Northumbrian coast, uh, where I'm going for a Celtic Christian retreat later in the summer. That's Thank probably you. enough for me. If you want to ask me questions, come and give me a shout. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. And the Darcing meeting tomorrow afternoon is at the Hunters Hill, Hunters Hill right here. Community Centre, 2 o'clock, 2 o'clock, if you're interested. Right. Thanks. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll pick it up a bit. What I'm going to do um, is we're going to run through a couple of the things we've got up here fairly quickly because I do want to leave some, some, some time at the finish there to play with these rocks and see what takes place. I think it's fairly important we do that. And for those that don't know, what we're actually going to do is it will be filmed and it will make an article. We've actually been writing about the fact we're going to chase this up, and this is part of this process of chasing up what these rocks do. So from our point of view, we need this for our article anyway. So what we're going to try and do is go through the next hour. I might race through a couple of sections of this because I'm working to a clock now. So hit the button, please. In. Oh, it's up there, is it? Are we doing the compass side first? Oh, God. Okay, right up. Uh, Evan promised us next we were going to, I was going to show you this magnificent stuff from Trina's site. Um, yeah, well, I didn't... Where did did compass get in there before that? Oh, fair enough then. Okay, I'll accept that. It's, it's the same order I've got. Okay, let's move along. We'll go through some of this quick. I didn't know we were going to get through this. This one, by the way, ancient aliens from America wanted to film. Um, it was quite funny because I went there about 10 years ago, or about 8 years ago, and I couldn't remember where it was. And I told her that, and they were freaking out in America big time. And even when we got there, all she wanted to know is we're going to find this site. And I've got to tell you, I didn't think I was going to find it again. What's unusual about this site, and I am going to be very quick because I want to get to the rock, so I'm going to whiz through a bit, is that rock there is incredibly hard. It's in the middle of nowhere in the bush there. And when you get closer and you get up right close to that circle, you'll find it's not straight lines like a chisel. And get used to this, it was cut in one motion. We have found rock after rock, rocks like these where they are cutting the rocks, not chiseling, but cutting. Very important. This is part of a technology that took place here that people may not fully understand, but we'll get you there. What's equally important, ladies and gentlemen, there are eight arms. And they're all 45 degrees apart and they're straight. Now, original people don't do straight anything. And they don't do perfect circles. Have a look at their art. You will never find straight lines and circles like that. Now, this is where it gets real interesting. This is why ancient aliens wanted to pick it up. Do you know what? We got a professor from Newcastle to come out and look at this and he said, yeah, we can do it in the laboratory with laser, but we can't do it in the field yet. Nobody can do it in the field yet. This technology we haven't got to. Now, here's the trick. North, that one there, we measured it. It's wrong. It's 15 degrees off. This compass was done when North was in a different position than what it's in now. That means one of two things that a person has made this machine recently, only one in the world, has gone into the bush where no one is, made this, but can't read a compass. That's one possibility. Or it was made earlier when the compass was pointing north at that direction and now the axis has changed. When did the axis last move? About 12 to 15,000 years ago when a major conflagration took place. Is that marking that out? More than likely. The question is, ladies and gentlemen, we're in Australia. Stick, bone, and what's the other one? Stone technology. None of them could do that. They spent a lot of time on that, and Evan spent about 21 greetings with Giorgio. Yeah. He kept shaking hands, and they do it again. The bird flew past. Let's shake hands, and then something else happened. And I kept thinking all the time, better you do it than me. I would have walked off. Okay, so that's a compass. We're going to race through these a bit because I do want to play with the rocks. So, okay, skip that part. We won't go on to that, but we'll go to Bulgandry. Now, Bulgandry is important for people who believe in UFOs and aliens simply because that's what it is. There's the rays coming off there. Now, Gabby Tuncan will tell you the story. I'm going to work with the elders here. 
Uh, Bull Gandry holds the sun in one moon, hand and the moon in the other, which is what Thoth does. Same thing, because he's a god of wisdom, but remember he's Bull Gandry before he's Thoth. Through the middle is the belt of Orion, and by his foot is an eight metre canoe. That is the canoe, according to Gabby, that a Bull Gandry and all the others came through the Milky Way to come to this earth. That's the story of them coming there. And I think I told you before, further down you'll find there's four kangaroos near that particular canoe, which we are told they brought here. Makes sense, you know, because kangaroos and wallabies are the only animals in the world that can pick when they want to fall pregnant. I bet a lot of women wouldn't mind doing that. Only kangaroos and wallabies can do it. They decide when they want to fall pregnant. They're not like any other animal. Now I've been told by the elders they're not from here. That makes sense to me in every possible way. So, Borg Andrew, we did a map of that. And what's fascinating is, ladies and gentlemen, see that bit there? That's a circle with a little tail on the end, like a piece of sperm. But what's really important, ladies and gentlemen, everyone looks at Bulgandry and says, isn't that amazing? They looked at the wrong person. The most important person in the story is the woman down here, Bulgandry's wife, Mulla Mulla. The reason is, is she is pregnant and she's holding the kangaroo, the lawman. She controls the law. She controls the law, not Bulgandry. You've got to understand something. Original society is matrilineal, not patrilineal. It's female orientated. And that's basically a breakdown of that particular site. If you ask Gavin, you'll see it on um, Ancient Aliens. Gavin will tell you the full story, and he does it much better than I do because he's done up in his proper lawman coat, kangaroo coat, and he'll tell you the full story. And he said he would only go on Ancient Aliens if he could talk about the Pleiades. He said, We're sick of it. These white fellas never cover our story. If they're going to talk about the Pleiades, then we'll go on. That was easy for ancient aliens. That was no problem. They were going to talk about the Pleiades. OK, next one, please, Evan. Ah, yes, the site. We do have to talk about this. As far as I'm concerned, it's the most important site in the world, not just Australia, but in the world. It's called the Standing Stone Site. It's 184 to 188 stones. I'm not sure how many to begin with. That is exactly how it looks. We have the map. This site was destroyed in 1940 by the Australian government um, because it was brought to the world's attention in 1939. There was news about it all over the world. Frederick Slater found this place and he worked on it. He was the president of the Australian Archaeological Society and because he walked on this, worked on this site, he got smashed, didn't he, Evan? Every record, every picture. You cannot find a picture of this man. You cannot find anything about him. He made a cardinal mistake here. He started talking about what this meant. Really dangerous uh, object there. Okay, now we're going to skip that bit, Evan, because we're going to move through a bit. What Evan's going to now do is he's going to read an article, and this is going to shock you a bit. This comes from 1934 or 35? Uh, 37. 37. 1937. I am a teacher, and I taught Ab Studies. In fact, I helped write the course for New South Wales. I taught the kids in the 1930s, the original people were being smashed. I was wrong. I was so wrong. He's going to read you stuff that was written in the front pages of the papers, we've got lots of them, where Slater talks about things that you would not believe they were published in 1935 because you won't get them up today in a newspaper. Tell them what they said in 1935 about what Slater was doing, Evan. Mr Slater seeks to prove that the Stone Age Aboriginal believed that men came from a protoplasm created by God as a special species and that the original man could speak from the moment of his creation. Offers evidence the Stone Age Aboriginal had a deep knowledge of the human circuitry system, that he believed that the origin of this planetary system was tidal, and he understood the creation of the world and knew much about light, darkness, and fire. Fresh evidence is also given that he believed in the immortality of the soul. It is stated, too, that aspects of Mr Slater's research will be of particular interest to students of the origin and history of Freemasonry. The Freemasons? Professor Elkham's a Freemason in 1932. He was up in the Kimberley region and he met with original people that were naked and he could not communicate with them. He used all the neighbouring languages. This is quite well known, this. And he gave up. Elkham was a Mason. And then the elders started signing to him in ancient Masonic signs and then they started speaking in ancient Egyptian. Yes, the Freemasons would have an interest in there, but so would the ancient Egyptians. Now, what this guy had discovered, ladies and gentlemen, and it tells us in that article that Evan didn't read, is that Slater got a hold of a sacred language called Murugalba. Gives the keys to the many avenues of investigation, yeah? It's, yeah. It's the cut we've been covering out 
for a while now. We wish we could find it. Yes, we can. Now, this particular manual, you see, she wrote a song about Mile Creek, about how the original people were smashed. She won their trust, and the elders gave her and sat down with her and told her the first language. By the way, this is the first language in the world ever. And told her how to read it. Slater got that manual. And he went up to the Standing Stone site and the Baragara site and he read it. Okay, next picture please. And we'll tell you what he read in a sec. Now as we go through this very quickly, you're going to see up there shaped rocks. The shaped rocks are a language, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of these rocks I have here, the shaped ones, I'll give you one example, has a very large story with it, with these lines on this. This is actually a language. The rocks themselves make a language and so do the lines and the intersections. It's a very, very sublime language. Okay, keep moving. What you're also going to find, when we go to this place, there is sandstone that is fine-grained and coarse-grained together. There are all types of rocks at this one particular site, but what's really important is there are hundreds and hundreds of sand sandstone rocks there, and we're in a caldera. It's all igneous. There are no sandstone there, and we sent people looking for it. There is a sandstone deposit 25 k's away, and there are thousands of tons of rocks there. How did they move them? Move on, please, Evan. Okay, notice how the rocks have been cut. There's no percussion points. If you get a rock that's been cut, like this one hasn't been cut by percussion points. This is actually an original rock too. This is the sort of stuff they do everywhere. We've got lots of rocks like this. You get a percussion points where they hit it, and they hit it on the side, and you get a bulb. No bulbs. This is sharp. This is sharp. There are rocks there. There's one there. You run it on your face, you'll bleed. They're that sharp. They're laying on the ground now. There's hundreds of them because it was bulldozed. There's one rock there, which actually is a symbol that means the guide that the soul brought in with the unity of life. That is their language. Their language is a lot different to ours. Keep moving, please, Evan, because we're moving along. So next to the large mound is a small mound. That is 3,500 cubic metres of fill. Geologists have looked at that and said all of the material in that mound doesn't belong here. It was brought here. We also know that mound was there in 1940. When the first whitefellas came in, we found people, original people, on the mounds with rocks and they ran off with them. So we know it's not European. So my question to you is, how do the original people move thousands of cubic metres of fill, which is sandstone, white sand, red sand and clay, which doesn't belong there, how do they pick it up? That's 70 metres long by 5 metres high. That's a massive piece of work. Next one, please, mate. There's a breakdown of the actual mound, and there's a count of all the different stones there. And do you realise if I go past that point, you will not find another sandstone anywhere for 5 or 10 k's in any direction? Something odd happened here, way back. Next one, please, mate. There's more cuts again, more shaped rocks. Just keep moving through them. We're not going to worry about that too much today because we're going for some other shaped rocks. Notice each one of them is different. And believe me, they all have a meaning. OK, keep going. Ah, this was found at the port. And we're not going to talk about the port today, Evan. This particular rock, I just assumed it was an interesting rock. By the way, the elder gave me this. Well, there's better stuff than this. We went to the port where there are literally... 100,000 rocks like this, and he threw it at me and said, take this for the white fellas and the black fellas who don't believe in this stuff. Have a look at this and tell, ask yourself, how do you do this with rock on rock? You can't. You can't. What I can do is I can cut a piece of paper with it, and I can cut my skin with it. That takes work. I've been told by Uncle Marbuck, you didn't hear this, no. it's a power rock. It's a power rock, and I'm not going to show people how to use it, because I did then. Okay, keep moving, please, Evan. Right, that's one of those stories we get. Look, I'd better do a bit of blackfella magic here, right? Yeah, take the magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now some blackfella magic. Probably a little bit better than my trick, but, we'll, you know, as I said, whitefella magic has its problems. We cut this off because that's a standing stone site. Now, what happened? This is a true story, by the way. Um, Evan got this picture from Iris Nunn, who was on the site on the day. We actually took ten elders out first to check the place out. And I'll tell you what happened there. When we went there, we went onto the site, and Carno, who's now passed on, stood on top of the mountain and said, I'm waiting for the spirits to accept us. And it leads to this. And we said, what? Because it was me. I don't think you were there. You weren't even with me, were you? It was just me. Oh, All the elders. Because we had 20 people waiting to come on, but unless we got permission from the spirits, we weren't going on. And Carno said, I've got to get permission. I said, I'll do it. And he said, I want hawks. I said, oh, God. You want hawks, of all things. He actually called for hawks. Oh, that's going to be fun. Two appeared. Came out of the bush and circled around. I said, is that enough? He said, no. I said, no. 
I want more. And he called again. There were six. By the way, it's a true story. The right people saw this. And I looked and said, is that enough? He said, no, I want the sacred number. He wanted eight, making a figure eight, which, by the way, is the symbol on there. And ladies and gentlemen, I swear to you, eight hawks came and appeared. And they circled around in figure eight. He turned to me and said, go and get the rest now. He said, but follow that hawk. You ever tried to follow a hawk when it's going one and a half k's? You have to run all the way along. And the bloody thing kept its shadow just in front of the track, so I had to keep running all the way there. By the time I got to that mob, I nearly collapsed. And the, the story was, we can now go in. Now, the story has an interesting ending, because at the end of the story, Iris was on the mound with some others. Two weeks later, she took a picture of a double rainbow coming off the mound. And Evan, you were the one who found it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was on a Facebook thing, isn't it? Yeah, Facebook. Right. Yeah, it was on those Facebook things. And he said, have a look at the Facebook thing. And I said, I don't want it because Kano wants to talk to me. Now, when Kano, what happens is someone rings me to tell me Kano wants to talk to me. He never rings. Then you have to ring straight away. My problem is I can't use mobile phones because some people know I'm a Luddite from way back, aren't I, Shane? There's no one like me when it comes to Luddite-ness, if there's such a word as that. And I wanted him to ring the mobile phone to ring Kano, but he wouldn't. He made me look at that. And he showed me, he said, look at that. I said, oh, bugger off. Two brain bays. Right, now give me the phone. So I ring the phone up. Now, he t Iris took that photo at 12 o'clock on Wednesday. Kano rings to me. He said, did you feel it? I said, what do you mean, Kano? What did he said, didn't you feel it yesterday? He said, oh, no, Makano, I did a typical white fella. He said, well, he said, 12 o'clock yesterday. We're all talking about it. This is a kangaroo island 3,000 k's away. He said, we felt the mound that came alive when she took that photo. She said, I said, and he said, told me this. He said, no, I didn't tell him about this. He said, you've got proof of it, haven't you? I said, yeah. He said, I thought you did. He said, go and have a look at it again. What's interesting is have a look at the second rainbow. It's back the front. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, that's coming off the mound there. That's the mound we're talking about. Is it a sacred place? Absolutely. Now. You've heard of Stonehenge, where they put the rocks back, right? We've got a map before it was destroyed by the Australian government. Yes, they went to the door of the farmer and told him they'd confiscate the land, so they destroyed the site. Two weeks before, we've got a full map where every rock goes. And we know where the rocks are because they were bulldozed into the ground. So that mound can be rebuilt. And the interesting part is we have the song of the stone arrangement and the song of the hand signs that go with it. We can sing it back. So that, unlike the standing stones, the um, Stonehenge, which is a relic of the past, if we can put this back together, it's still alive. It hasn't died. We have the songs for it. But there's a way to go with that. Oh, dear. OK, next one, please. No, we're going to skip that. OK, that's the port site where the actual the rocks were delivered. OK, that's where we've got the rocks, and we're just going to go through that because we really do want to get to another site. We'll skip the shape rock, skip all that. Oh, by the way, I should make that point. Can you go back there? I'll just show you one thing. Can you go back to that picture? No, next one. No, no. OK, that's it. If I take this line here, that line there, and that line there, they'll meet equidistantly at exactly the same point there. This is beautiful mathematics. That point, that point, and that point meet in the same point. This wasn't just knocked together for two minutes or something to do to fill in your time. Absolutely, who was involved in the conversation, I know what was said. Um, there are people, it's always the case, conscience will always come back. There's a person who's going to give this up. I can't say who and I can't say when, but they will give it up. And there's a couple of people who know what I'm talking about, know a bit more about it. But I can tell you now, what those other people said is correct. It was found in, it was found before 78. It's been there for quite some time. It is legitimate and it has not been made by any of these other people. That story about the drains check, it was given to you by Alan Dash, who was working for Gosford City Council. Are you aware very soon after he did that, he got a job with National Parks and Wildlife and still holds it to this day? It was such a cover-up at every level. And it was a conspiracy, and I can tell you now, to involve the army... It doesn't just go to the local council. You have to go to the Commonwealth to get this involved. This will come. It will all come up. We're very comfortable talking about it now because we know the full story. If I could tell you more, I would, but I can't because then I tell you the name of the people involved and they've got to make that decision themselves. What have we got there? It's the truth. Can we go back one first? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you've seen it, 
There's about 300, I think well, probably half the people in this room have seen it. Who's seen the glyphs here? This, oh, God. A lot of you. The ones who haven't, go and have a look at it, for God's sake, please. It's legit. Okay, you've seen the walls before. We'll go through them quickly. There's a breakdown of one section of it, which we've, what I've done is I've gone through in Proto-Egyptian from Ray Johnson's manual and worked something out. And what I have worked out, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the wall that's still got a roof on the top, that is Proto-Egyptian. I can find you Nefer there. I can find the part about the wrecked boats. I can find the part about one of them dying. That's all there. I don't argue that point. But when you go past that wall to the other two walls, and you may have seen videos about it, they won't show you the other two walls. I'll do the first wall, and they'll read you through that and tell you what it is. You know why they won't show you the other two walls? Because our manual, the Proto-Egyptian, we only got a 42% match, and they won't do much better. There are glyphs there that no one recognises. And you know, when they sent the officials there, the two academics in the late 80s, they came back and said, that's not Egyptian. There's stuff in there that's Sumerian. There's stuff that's all over. Yes, because this, ladies and gentlemen, go away from that. That's the Egyptian narrative. The rest of that narrative is original. The original people were the ones to write first. How do I know that? Aunty Bev told me this. We wrote before they did. The Egyptians came here to learn their language, their writing, their religion, and their knowledge. They got it from us. I want to make that clear, and I'm not the only one who said that. We've got more that say the same thing. They came here in pilgrimage, like people go to Mecca, to learn from their betters. Very important. As um, Slavis is the Egyptians learned their system of hieroglyphs from the ancestors of our Aborigines. And that came out of a report from the newspaper in 1935. Slater, who we're going to talk about, is involved in the Standing Stone site. You're going to find out the Egyptians learnt their, 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 their whole thing comes from here. All that they've learnt. They came here first and took it back. Now, the original narrative, that glyph is the most important glyph there. It starts the second wall. Uh, we've been working with Laird Scranton on this one. He believes that's the marker for the first language called Narki. It has two other meanings, black man and serpent. That's why it belongs there. And then there's a narrative that goes through there. Now, what I'm not going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm not going to give you my interpretation of that because I don't think it's important. You see, who cares what it means if mainstream doesn't even believe it's legitimate? We have to prove it's legitimate first, then argue about what it means. And I think to an extent the fact that we've got three, three different groups arguing with each other about what it means is not helping. We shouldn't be fighting over what it means until we get people to agree that it's legitimate. Because at the moment... Mainstream says, this is a fake. Well, that's what we've got to work on first. I can say the mainstream's days are numbered because we know that that's going to come unstuck. But for now, let's move through that, mate. OK, uh, Michael Tellinger and Louise, they actually have been to the glyph. They went there straight away, and I can tell you now, they locked into it at a much better level. They locked into it at a spiritual level. Um, and this guy... And this lady really did understand it's a spiritual site. That's why we put them up there. They did understand why they were there. Next one, please, mate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do now... I haven't done this for a while, have we? No. God. OK. What I'm going to do now is one of the reasons we got involved in this to begin with is... Now, let's look at the Egyptian story, because that's all we're doing right now. I'm starting with... I said we go back. Now, the Egyptians were here from 440 years ago to 4,600 years. They were here for 4,200 years. We know where they left. They left at Balmoral. All four of them were speared when they stole some rocks from the middle and they were told never to come back. And they came here 4,600 years ago and they started to carry on. And they were here, and here's the part you need to understand, all of that time. You do realise there are a group of Egyptians now, aren't you, Evan? Yep. What have they said? Oh, but, um, they have Rights of an embassy. Yeah, um, yeah, colonial rights as a, an embassy here in Australia. There are, one of there. Yeah, there are Egyptians now claim that they have rights to set up an embassy here, and actually they do. They do have rights. They've got more rights than the bloody British. Anyway, let's start with this one, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to show you a group of um, engravings all near Carry On, but I won't tell you where. The first one here is of an unk. It's, it's actually, we were taken out by a gentleman who was a senior park ranger at the time of this place. And he also has a degree in geology. And his claim is, and I'm not going to argue with this, 
we saw about 80 different engravings. This was the oldest by a long way. In fact, 22 pictures to take that. And we sent someone out there recently, yeah, didn't we? And they couldn't find it. They could not find it. It's so worn. We were lucky because they knew exactly where to look and we waited for the sun just to come out. For it could have been done by a parrot, for all I know. Everyone's been chucked in. But the one thing I can tell you about all those stories, I, I can't give you a name. There isn't one. They're all groups of people and, and in this, this, like a deranged check and a, a vet that's not here anymore. I want to tell you the, the truth. And I'll go in two parts. First of all, I'll tell you what Aunty Bev said, who was the last darking young elder. Then I'll tell you what David Fitzgerald said, who was paid by National Parks and Wildlife to be the Aboriginal Sites Officer when it was found. Their testimony should count for something. I can tell you what Aunty Bev tells us about the glyphs. They are. Some of them are Egyptian. And you know, the women would go there every second year for millennia and coat it with women's urine to keep it fresh. David Fitzgerald who was taken there in 1978, checked the records. They didn't see it until 1983, according to their records. He was taken there by National Parks and Wildlife in 78. And when he went there, he couldn't see a thing because the walls were full of refuse. And they hired six men, two days, to clear it out. And they moved out about five tonne of rubbish, 1978. According to one report from National Parks and Wildlife in 1975, we've got a deranged check just walking through there with a chisel in hand, just punching away as he feels like it. David told me there was 25 years of refuse there. If you look very carefully there, you'll find out why the glyphs are kept fresh. There was a wall on top, a ceiling on top, and it fell down. It broke. There are still parts of the wall that are ceiling there. All of this is true. Now I'm going to tell you the part of the story that I can't substantiate, but I know it's true because I know that one of the people eventually is going to give it up because their conscience is killing them. When it was found in 1978, not 83, the person in charge decided they didn't want anything to do with it. And they put it on to some others. And I can tell you, one of the plans was to blow it up. They had arranged with the Commonwealth Government to use the Gosford Glyphs for artillery practice. And it was going to be blown up. I know that is a fact because I know carry on. I'm going to tell you this. I happen, the reason why we're talking about it now is I know something I can't tell you. If there's anyone in this room that thinks it's a fake, don't put your hand up and say it because you're going to make a fool of yourself because it isn't. I know it's going to be proved and I know it'll be proved within two years. I know that as a fact. I wish I could say so much more because there's a camera here, isn't yeah. there? I'll, I'll be as cryptic as I can. Yeah. Right, before we start talking about carry on, you've probably heard stories about University students that were bored one day and decided to spend three weeks out there in the 60s. By the way, do you know the Sydney Uni have never taught hieroglyphs and never taught Egyptology? So I'd like to know why they were doing it and who supervised it. I want to meet the person because apparently our next lecturer went out there and supervised the thing for three weeks. I'd love to meet this person and find out what right they've got to supervise anything. Sydney Uni have never taught hieroglyphs, they've never taught Egypt Egyptology. And by the way, if they had done it, you don't think one of those students one day when they got drunk wouldn't have started boasting about it? Come on, you don't think someone would have given their name up by now? That's rubbish. What about the deranged check that wandered in there between the walls in 1975 with a chisel? No hammer, just a chisel, and made all this. That's a good one. I've heard that a lot. You might have heard the one about the grieving World War I uh, veteran who decided to make a monument in the bush in the middle of nowhere. He did make one in St. Ives where there were no hieroglyphs at all. It was just a monument. But he made this one in the middle of nowhere where no one ever see it as a monument to his friends. That's a possibility too. And you know what? It could have been done by hippies. It could have been done by New Ages. And